good to see everyone. Um, visitors, family, everybody is so, so excited to be here today. Just a couple of announcements. This Friday night is our annual packathon. And we're, we're real excited to be able to, to come together and to use God's hands and provide food for those who are <coughs> so in need of food. Um, the other announcement is the flu clinic <coughs> is going to be on October the 10th, 4 to 7. And I, I'll throw in one other thing. The uh, women's convocation for this year in North and South Carolina is going to be at um, Union Lutheran Church in Salisbury on October the 15th. And if you need any information, see Suzanne Beverly. Pastor Ken, um, hold on one second. I'm going to ask Mike Ashley to come forward.
Let us stand. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open and all desires known, and from whom no secrets are kept, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are not in sin and cannot free ourselves. given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins as a called and ordained minister of the church of Christ and by his authority I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. The Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Generously pardon and give peace to your faithful people, O Lord, that being cleansed from every sin, we may be free and glad to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
get up very early. Uh, so sometimes the kids would walk by and say, I got something in this bag. I got something. You know what it is? Uh, there might be some air in there. <laughs> what I got in here is dangerous. It is a killer. All I can do is kill it. He come out. It'd be a snake. It could be a killer snake. It could be an aluminum coated possum. <laughs>
all of your, all of you together, as if you were a leaning fence, a toppling wall. They bless with their lips, but in their hearts they curse. For God alone, my soul silences. <coughs> he alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. Put your trust in him always, O people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. On the scales they are lighter than bread, all of them. belongs to God. Here is the reading of the psalm. The New Testament reading comes from 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, 1 through 14. Paul, an epistle of Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of the life that's in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as did my ancestors, with a clear conscience, as I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. As I remember your tears, I long to see you, that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of, I am reminded of you in sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure it dwells in you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan and to fame the gift of God, which is in, your, in you through the laying on of the hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who saved us and called us to be a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the age began, and which now has been, been, un, has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a speak, preacher an apostle and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. This is the word of the Lord.
us all stand as we are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Now the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, Temptations to sin are sure to come. But woe to the one through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were cast into the sea, than that he should cause one of these little ones to sin. Pay attention to yourself. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him, when he has come in from the field, Come at once and recline at table. Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me and dress properly, and serve me while I eat and drink, and afterward you will eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, We are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. The gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Friendly greetings from your brothers and sisters in Christ at First Lutheran Church in Pontiac, Illinois, and it is a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I know things are going well out there. As a matter of fact, uh, I have a gentleman who speaks for me when I'm gone, and they hear the rocks at me when I get back. So uh, uh, I don't know. They might throw rocks at you for having me here. I don't know. <laughs> I need to tell you something about your pastor that he didn't know I was going to do this. You don't know he has a side job. Did you? you didn't know this. He moonlights. And, I, and when you hear what he moonlights, as you're going to see, he has a lot of competition. He is and has been working on this for many years to be a tele savavis in person. <laughs> in his office with a great big mirror with a fedora on it, one of those old hot cinnamon suckers, saying, who loves you, baby? <laughs> so he is trying to be the lead in the new Telly Savalas in my office that's coming down. But there's a few of you trying to give him a run for his money. I can see that right now. Some of those that older know who Telly Savalas is. The kids are looking, what's he talking about? <laughs> the rest of you do wonder what I'm talking about here. But no, it is a pleasure to be with you. And the only thing I will say is, would you please, please, move the state of North Carolina to the west of Indianapolis? Please do that. This is, this is the, oh, this is the most awful drive ever. No matter which way you I mean, there is no good way to get here. You've got to move this place. You've got to do something. But no, it is, it's a wonderful thing to be here with you. But it is a long drive for me. But good to be with you. Want to speak to you, and you will see a theme in the text about faith. Faith. Well, what is faith? What is faith? You know, we have a lot of people today who run around and they, I call it, name it, claim it, blame it, grab it. I want this. I claim money. How's that working out for everybody in the famous words of Dr. Phil? Ain't working out too good, is it? I don't even look at my retirement account anymore. I was going to retire two weeks after I was dead when I first got to the uh, Now we're looking about 20 years, so they're just going to stuff me and put a smile on my face and put me back in the corner. Because we're looking about 20 years after I'm dead at this point. But what is faith? You can't command God. I command, you know, you just do this formula and you'll get rich. You plant your seed. How many of you see that thing on TV late at night? You know what seed really is? Seed has nothing to do with money. It has everything, Mr. Late, 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 late night preacher. It has everything to do with the gospel. That's what we are to spread. The gospel has nothing to do with money. And if you were thinking that, man, I hate to break it to you, you were wrong. But 
Faith is not something we can do. Man and God work. Because if that is true, then who really is God? If he hops when we say jump, then who really is God? You've got to really think about that for a moment. God is God and he will do whatever it is. And he will act in each and every situation exactly as he desires. Don't think you're going to have a predetermined outcome with God. That's not the way it works. You know, it would have been nice when that hurricane hit down in Florida and it just kind of went through, nothing happened. But you see, that's what we want. We have to understand that sometimes God works in different ways. He doesn't always bring help when you think it's going to come. I have a couple of quotes here for you from something I'd written a while back. This is actually from Pope Francis. And he says this, Who among us? Everybody, everybody is talking down. Who among us has not experienced insecurity, loss, and even doubts on their journey of faith? Everyone. We've all experienced this. He says, me too. Everyone is part of the journey of faith. It is part of our lives. This should not surprise us because we are human beings marked with fragility and limitations. We are all weak. We all have limits. Do not panic. We all have it. So when you have doubts, doubt is part of faith. Oh! <laughs> doubt, I thought faith maybe was going to happen the way I wanted it. No! Faith leaves room for doubt. It leaves room for doubt. If it were not, it would be static. You would need faith if we knew what was going to happen. If it was already set in stone the way everything was going to turn out. You would need faith. I already know how that's going to turn out. You see, faith leaves room for doubt. We see this all throughout the scripture. Do you remember that old sly guy named the serpent in the Garden of Eden? What does he really do in the Garden of Eden when you really get down to where the rubber meets the road? What does he really do? He brings doubt. He brings doubt to Adam and Eve. Why? Because now they are doubting the word of God. That's what he does to us. He brings doubt and doubt is a part of life. I've often wondered, as Pastor Kim was talking about, when I was uh, looking at going into the ministry, I still have doubts whether something I'm going to be in the ministry. I really do. They are too by this time. <laughs> but, hey, you have doubts. Should I? Is this what God really wants for me? Is this where I really belong? You see, doubt is part of everyday life. I just had heart surgery. I laugh on real good. Going real well. But I kind you know, I didn't really have doubts about the surgery, but I had doubts about what it was going to be like after the surgery. Because Dr. Smith, who was the surgeon in Bloomington, he uh, he said, You're going to be wondering what the truck hits you. And he said, and I said, Well, I hope you get this license number because it's going to be a rough thing. It was not fun, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. You do feel like for a week that an elephant's sitting on your chest. That's not very fun. But again, doubt. Doubt is just part of life. It's part of everyday life. Now, faith is something that God gives us. Well, I thought we had faith. Yes, we do have faith. But if you look in the gospel text, it talks about the faith as the seed of a mustard. Very small seed. Very, very small, small seed. And everybody says, yeah, that's a small thing. And I've got to short out. No, he's saying you don't even have faith. That's what he's really saying. You don't even have faith. Because what? It has to come from God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. We are what? Saved by grace. Comma. They even taught me this at the university, believe it or not. Oh, I know what a comma does. I'm not very good at it, but it does. We are saved by grace. Comma. Not works, lest any man should boast. Comma. And this to get to God. Now, if I was taught right at the university, and good old Catholic College up here. Then that first clause and that last clause, you can skip over the middle when they come in. <coughs> we are saved by grace through faith, and this is the gift of God. You see, faith comes from God. It's not something that I have or you have. No, it's something that God places with it. I can't grow. And it can become something bigger than it is in my life. And what I have learned to do is just trust God. When I was in seminary, 
Bill Leonard looked at me one day and he says, you know, he says, we as Baptists have a problem. I thought, oh man, this is going to hear. I was all meant the way for it, you know. Baptist roots. And I said, oh, you got a problem. And he looks at me and I'm the only Lutheran in the class and I sit in the back. And he says, I think all the Lutheran brother in the back has figured it out. And I thought, oh Lord, this ain't good because it ain't good to get called out in class. <laughs> it's just not good, especially if you're as dumb as I am. And he says, but I think all Lutheran friends back there have figured it out. And he says, now, sir, he says, if I, if I do not do service to your faith, you let me know. But he says, the way I understand it through salvation, that you people basically in the waters of baptism throw yourself on the mercy of God, and you let the chips fall where they may. I said, well, for a Baptist, that ain't too bad. <laughs> What we just have to trust that his promises are true. That's what he was saying. Because I can't have faith to save myself. I can't have faith in anything like that. Can't do it. I have to trust that Jesus has taken care of those things. That's where faith really comes in. Dude, during 9-11, you know, a lot of people <coughs> would ask, where was God in didn't cause that. God did not cause people to do those terrible and those awful things. Almost 3,000 of our fellow Americans died on that very fateful day. It wasn't God's fault. God didn't do that. So where is God? Where is God? If you're the pastor and you're walking around with your fancy little collar on the day after we're going 9 12 and somebody says, Where's God? What's going to be your answer? You better not have some generic glib answer that goes on a billboard. You better not have that. No, there's really no answer, but God is truly in the response. God was found in the response. He was not the one who made those planes go down. He is not the one who caused those people to devise this evil thing. You see, God was with those people. We have a lot of people today, they, they're into this thing called the prosperity doctrine. The prosperity. They're going to prosper. They're going to live long and prosper with the spot, I guess. The prosperity. And you know, the, way, the way you know this is I'm blessed and highly favored of God because I've got the best parking spot of the world. <laughs> God loves me better than everybody else because I've got the best parking spot. And if you ever in Illinois in the middle of the winter, you better hope you get the best parking spot because the wind blows out there like you ain't never seen. It'll blow you away. But there's a problem with that kind of thing. What about the poor guy who was at the hospital and just heard that he had stage four cancer? So you're saying God loves you better than that person? What about the child or the person who grew up in a third world country? I've been to a third world country many years ago. It's not a pretty sight. So God loves me and you more than he does that person? That's what I'm saying. <coughs> this stuff don't preach in Sub-Saharan Africa, I'm telling you. Only preaches on late night television. Can I give you a little advice since I ain't even your pastor? Don't watch that junk. Turn it off. <laughs> and people are crazier than I am. <laughs> That's the truth. And I'm from West Virginia, buddy. I know crazy. I know crazy. As John Boyd Billy says, we don't suffer from insanity, we actually enjoy it. <laughs> Turn that junk off. That's the truth. You see, faith is in God doesn't love you or me more than somebody. We're just very blessed that we live where we live. We got a problem, yes. But that person's faith is just as alive as our faith. God cares for that person just as much as us. And he is with that person. <clears throat> well, why didn't God fix it? Well, God was there. He was there when Jesus at the mock trial and at the garden. What does
does he do? Jesus had doubts. You say, oh, no, he did. Seriously, he did. What does he do in the garden? He says, Father, if there's some other way, and I paraphrase, if there's some other way that I don't have to go through this thing, then find that way. If there's something we haven't thought of, Father, if there's something that we missed, See, that's a man having doubts because he understands what's coming. But what does Jesus say? I claim him what no. He says, nonetheless, not my will, Father, but your will. You see, it did pass, but what happened? He had to go through it. He had to drink the cup before it passed. Sometimes you've got to go through things. I did not want to have them crack my chest open and do what they did. <coughs> God, I believe in healing. I believe in those things. I believe God does it, but that was not the path yeah. God had for me. Thank God for modern technology that they can do what they do. But God was with us. Matter of fact, my servant, he, he's a praying man. Praying about it. Whole staff praying. You see, God was with us during that time. God goes with you no matter where you are. No matter what you're suffering for. No matter what happens, God goes with you. I'd like to end with a quote. Actually, two quotes. One is from the great theologian Miroslav Volf, who, in his classic, Christian classic, uh, Exclusion and Embrace, he wrote this. In the final analysis, the only available option are either to reject the cross and with it the core of Christian faith or to take up one's cross, follow the crucified, and be scandalized every new by the challenge. You see, that's what every day is. We can either give up or we can follow the crucified. As the Gospel of Mark reports, the first disciples followed and were scandalized. Now, they're supposed to say, guess what? Have you ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs? What happened to those early Christians? They died horrible deaths. Horrible, horrible deaths. The first disciples followed and were scandalized. Yet, they continued to tell the story of the cross. Even though they were dying, they were still telling the story of the cross. That's what we have to do. Tell the story of the cross. Spread the gospel. Spread the good news. Including the account of how they abandoned the crucified. They even told it. In scripture, what do we see? They all ran. Every one of them went around too because the Romans were coming after them. They were next on the list after Jesus. The Romans didn't play games, brother. They didn't play games. They, they crucified them. That cuts your head off, but it cuts into your schedule. It's not a good thing when the Romans get on. But this is what the disciples face. They face certain death by following Jesus, according to what we would think. Why, he says, because precisely in the scandal, they discovered a promise in serving and giving themselves to others. In lamenting and protesting before the dark face of God, they found themselves in the company of the crucified. And that's the company I want when I'm suffering. I have ministered to hundreds of people who have gone to their death. And you know what? God was with them, even as they were leaving this world. If he can be with you then, he can be with you at any other time. And this is from Ellie Bazell. My questioning of God goes on. But even from the beginning, I believe in questioning God from, out, from inside faith, not from outside faith. It is because I believe that I am all the time questioning. Where are you, God? You see this in the events. You see this in the poetry of the Old Testament. Where are you, God? Why have you waited so long? Jesus on the cross, and this is our cry. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's us. 
You see, it's not all bowl full of cherries. It's not all bandit clean and blab and grab it and all that good stuff that people want you to think that it is. Faith is letting God be there. Being in His presence and letting Him lead you through. I'm never going to end with this. When I was going chaplaincy at the hospital hey. down in Charlotte, I will never forget this. One of the greatest lessons that I ever learned was from an old chaplain who had been there forever. And he worked in the trauma department at CMC at the time. I guess it's a But I mean, there were helicopters flying in there constantly. Hour after hour. I mean, there, this is bad stuff going on. This is level one trauma. And he told us this. He said the one thing you can be sure of is that the people when they are in here, they don't remember a word you say or a prayer that you pray. I mean, well, boy, thank you for really building me up here, brother. <laughs> but he said they will remember this, that you were there. That you were there, your presence. And always remember there is a greater presence, no matter where we are, that is with us at all times. And that is the presence of Jesus Christ. Let us go to our Lord. Yeah. 
Show us your mercy, O Lord. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under your care. Let your way be known upon the earth. Do not forget the needy, O Lord. Create in us clean hearts, O God. O Lord, hear our prayers of healing for Karen, for Midgey, and for Phyllis. We pray for families in our area, families that have been torn apart by strife, or families where relationships are broken. We ask that you would bring healing and bring whatever types of unity that can happen. We ask that you would be with all families, Lord. Grant within them the spirit of your love. We pray for the food that we will share here in a few moments, that we may share the food for a blessing and also the blessing of fellowship. We look outside the walls of our nation and we pray that you will be with the people of the Ukraine and that you would bring an end to the war and to the violence. We pray for the people of Pakistan amidst flooding that has taken up a large percentage of that country and displaced so many people. Lord, we ask that you would bring them and that you would build their nation, rebuild their nation and rebuild their faith. And then we look locally, Lord. We pray for all of those who were in the path of Hurricane Ian, for those in Florida, for those on the Georgia and South Carolina coastline, and for those who have been hurt, injured, or who have had any sense of loss during that time. We pray that you will look after them and that you will provide for them where their needs are the greatest. And we pray for the western part of our nation where there has been significant drought and where water is becoming a prime resource in danger. We also ask, oh God, that you would be with all congregations in the area of Concordia. All congregations that gather with Christ at the center that proclaim him as Lord. Be with them, grant them, and have, have them, create in them a zeal for the Spirit, that they might proclaim Christ in all. Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray for you to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but remember that we are ever walking in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, and was crucified and died in the Spirit. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended.
you have first given us. Use our talents to proclaim your love and your grace to the world. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
go in peace. And so the Lord.